Red Air Ambulance was just starting up by the dock as I raised the flag from its half-mast position. The chopper was taking the usual winter caretaker of Cabbage Island off to hospital in Lewiston, where his broken hip could be treated. He was lucky that one of the passing fishermen from Booth Bay on their last trip out before Christmas had noticed that the flag was not fully raised as normal. Old John, the caretaker, always raised and lowered the flag each day, just after sun-up and just before sunset. He was a stickler for doing things right. Even as the paramedics were strapping him onto the stretcher, he was itemising all the things I would need to do each day. Feed and walk the dog, raise the flag, check the foil in the dock lights, after I douse them, and trim the wicks, top up the generator fuel. He was still talking as the morphine kicked in, and he drifted off to sleep. I was beginning to wonder if my decision to volunteer as standing caretaker had been a good one. It was several years ago that the island owners had asked me if they could call on me, just in case. This was the first time I'd been needed. It started for me an hour or so earlier, with a call from the harbour master. The fishermen had radioed in their concerns, and nobody had been able to raise John on the radio. So the harbour master had sent a call for the air ambulance, and then phoned me. Chopper pilot and paramedics would need someone who knew the island in order to land safely and search for John. They'd be landing by the harbour in about fifteen minutes. I stuffed some spare clothes and a few essentials into a rucksack, dropped my door keys in with a neighbour and told her I'd be in touch. I just made it down to the harbour in time to meet the helicopter. As we lifted off from the harbour I could see the cold grey sea and the snow blowing in across the bay. I hoped I'd pack enough closed. The keen wind had blown the snow away from the decking inland from the dock. In the summer it would be full of visitors from the mainland coming in on the ferry to one of Cabbage Island's famous clam bakes. Day it was empty and icy. As we came into land I strained my eyes to see if I could spot John. If he was ill or injured I expected he might be somewhere near the flag still stood at half-mast. It did not take us long to find him. His dog was standing over him, barking loudly, as his master lay half in and half out of the generator shed. He had slipped on the ice near the flag on his way to raise it in his early morning ritual. He had managed to pull himself to the flagpole and raise it halfway before making to the nearest shelter. The helicopter threw up a flurry of snow as it took off and soon vanished into the grey skies. That left just me and the dog as the sole occupants of Cabbage Island. The only sounds were the flapping of the flag and the slapping of the ropes against the pole, and the steady sound of waves, slightly muffled against the snowy shore. I thought through John's list of my duties, dock lights, generator fuel. I'd better get started on my new daily routine, and then find breakfast. Getting inside to the lodge, to the comparative warmth and shelter, was a relief. The dog followed me, expectantly. Perhaps he thought he might get a second breakfast. The large room in the lodge was not heated. It was only used in the summer, and now was empty, and my footsteps echoed as I crossed the wooden floor and went to John's rooms. The kettle on the wood-fired range in the caretaker's rooms had almost boiled dry, so back out into the cold to pump some more water. This was going to be a different Christmas for me, a back-to-basic Christmas. The paramedics had told me it would be months before John would be up and about. I was going to have to make some calls on the radio and put my mainland life on hold for a while. But first, coffee and breakfast, even though it was lunchtime. John had a well-stocked larder, good dry-cured bacon on the bone, homemade bread, even eggs in water glass, that looked good for breakfasts. Tins of almost everything, jars of preserved fruit and vegetables, and enough sauerkraut to feed an army. This is Cabbage Island. Well fed, with a steaming mug of coffee by my side, I fired up the radio and called the Booth Bay Harbour Master. 
gave him messages to pass on to friends and neighbours about closing up my house, re-directing mail, getting some more clothes packed, ordering some supplies. The list seemed to go on and on. As I signed off, the harbour master wished me a Merry Christmas, and I sat and wondered how merry it was going to be, just me and the dog. Winter days are short up in Maine, and it was soon time to get down to the dock, light the lamps and lower the flag, and start planning a very quiet Christmas. At least have the dog to keep me company, and I was sure he'd enjoy some of the canned turkey with me. A cold, wet nose on my hand woke me on Christmas morning. Item one, feed the dog. Item two, walk the dog. Standing by the flag on a bright crisp morning with the sea lapping against the dock, I could see why John loved his life as an island caretaker, at least when the place was not heaving with visitors. I pulled my sketchbook from my pocket, one of the essentials I had packed, and made a quick study of the shore. That was one reason I knew the island so well. As an artist I made most of my living from paintings of the area, selling them to those some of the visitors. This was different somehow. I had not seen the place in winter. There was no regular ferry at this time. John's winter supplies and mail came in on local fishing boats on their way to the open sea. The quiet and the peace of the island were magical. Looking back towards the lodge where icicles were hanging from the eaves, I noticed for the first time the Christmas decorations by the fence and a life-size Santa by the big lodge window. I wondered why John had bothered with those, as there had only been him and the dog to see them. Enough musing. Time to open the canned turkey, put it in the oven, peel some potatoes, warm up some tin clam chowder and perhaps make some eggnog. If I could find John's stash of booze, I did hope there was some booze. There was booze. Sitting in the easy chair with a glass in my hand, stomach full of chowder, turkey, sauerkraut, mashed potatoes, and even some crisping pudding, I smiled at the equally full-looking dog snoozing in front of the log fire. He had, however, refused to wear the paper hat from his Christmas cracker. To my surprise, all of a sudden, he bounded up and ran barking to the door. Bewildered, and slightly the worse for the eggnog, I followed him and flung open the door. There stood Santa Claus. I looked at my glass in my hand. How much room had I put in that eggnog? Behind Santa were some other figures. Not elves, though, unless the U.S. Coast Guard had been recruiting in some strange places. Everyone laughed at the look of my face. Perhaps even the dog laughed, too. This explained the decorations. One thing John had forgotten to mention in his confused state was that the local Coast Guard cutter always called by on Christmas Day for a non-alcoholic, honest, cup of eggnog, a slice of John's Christmas cake, which I found with a little help, and to drop off some fresh provisions and a large ham bone for the dog. So my Christmas on Cabbage Island was not as lonely as I had anticipated. I even managed to offload several jars of that sauerkraut. <laughs>